we could not have met so frequently <laughs> so now we are great. live now we are live yeah it is the best thing we can meet now <laughs> okay so dr monty i think we can start yeah Good evening, dear friends. Welcome to the webinar of Indian Arthroplasty Association. I am Subhran Sumanti, the present president of the Indian Arthroplasty Association. <coughs> we started in 1995, and now we are in 2021. We crossed our Silver Jubilee year. You can find our uh, site in IndianArthroplastyAssociation.com. and if you have any suggestions to improve our activity you can send email to indianarthroplasty@gmail.com or to my personal email id dr ss mohanty@hotmail.com friends we have created two whatsapp groups for our live members ia1 and ia2 hope you are members of one of these whatsapp groups now i'm receiving many requests to make them members of this whatsapp group but the first you know requisite is that you should be a life member of indian arthroplasty association so if you are not a life member then please visit our site indianarthroplastyassociation.com become a member then you will automatically be kept in one of the groups where we will discuss all the you know difficult cases on day to day basis and you get all the information about the activities of our esteemed association dear friends during the pandemic you have been conducting webinars and we have rightly named it is as ia 360 degree webinar series and this is the 12th webinar in order and today it is focused on managing femoral bone loss in total hip arthroplasty now we have focused on acetabular bone loss in our last two last webinars and today we are focusing on managing femoral bone loss in total hip arthroplasty and our webinars are conducted on third tuesday of every month and you can see live through our youtube channel and facebook as well and today two stalwart conveners are there to manage this webinar and they have been kind enough and agreed and they have done lot of hard work to put this thing together Dr. Devabrat Pahdi from Apollo Hospital, Bhubaneswar. He is a senior consultant orthopedic and arthroplasty surgeon there, and uh, he is one of the conveners. And uh, Dr. Rakesh Rajput from Calcutta Medical Research Institute of Kolkata, from India, is the convener as well. So we welcome both the conveners today. In addition to that, we have a whole lot of star faculty today, and we welcome Professor John Timperley from Exeter UK. and professor timperley is not unknown to us he has participated in in our webinars beforehand today he has been kind enough to devote his time as well along with him we have our own indian faculty dr ajit kumar from bangalore dr anup jurani from jaipur dr kalai banan kanyan from chennai dr manish agrawal ortho onco surgeon from mumbai dr rajesh sharma our own president elect from delhi dr sutanu hazra from kolkata dr vidyasagar reddy from andhra pradesh and dr vijay singh again from mumbai dear friends today the webinar has been supported by smith and nephew we thank them for their participation now without much ado let me hand over the proceedings of the webinar to the conveners over to dr padi please uh, thank you sir Uh, give good evening to you all at the outset i thank uh, i along with uh, dr rakesh rajput thank the indian arthroplasty association uh, office bearers to have uh, given us this uh, task of uh, uh, doing this uh, webinar uh, number 12 this is a very good topic uh, which is a exhaustive topic that is proximal femoral bone loss so we will be uh, discussing uh, this uh, the every bit of this uh, proximal femoral bone loss through talks and through case discussions and we are very thankful to dr uh, john timperley to be a 
to have uh, agreed to be a part of this uh, webinar so without wasting time because it's a, a very exhaustive topic so we'll go ahead and keep the ball rolling with uh, dr ajit kumar who will be presenting on classification and outcome of femoral bone loss in totally arthroplasty dr ajit kumar hmm. yeah zoom very good evening uh, at the outset thanks to the president and the conveners for giving me this opportunity share screen is my screen visible yes visible okay. okay. so my brief is to talk on uh, the classification of femoral bone loss yes. and the outcomes in management uh, in this situation aapko subah aana padega amri sorry somebody is ha slide is not moving forward for some reason hmm you can yeah. click in the left and okay. some can i start again yeah, yeah. you can share your screen aapka yeah. ye number whatsapp hai so Can you please everyone mute is everybody to uh, mute Ajit, please Koi everyone others who are uh, not presenting I think I've been muted. No, you are not muted. We are able to hear you. We are able to hear you. You can see my screen. No, you share your screen. No, now you can share your screen, sir. One moment. Hmm. Sorry, just bear with me for a minute. Yes, screen. Can we see now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the topic is uh, classification of femoral bone loss, and uh, this is uh, becoming a pandemic now, just like we are facing the COVID pandemic, and the reasons are all too obvious. and uh, most often it is either infection or aseptic loosening that uh, we are encountering um but whatever be the cause bone loss is to be expected to a lesser or greater extent uh, in this situation and in uh, addition to the uh, the uh, primary cause while removing the implant itself uh, iatrogenic bone loss can also exacerbate the situation hence it's mandatory for proper preoperative assessment of the patient and we need to plan uh, absolutely in a very uh, methodical manner so this all goes without saying but for the completion sake detail history the post operative course the problems that the patient is facing whether it is pain whether it is instability whether it is uh, suggestion of infections So even a look at the grown zones in a cemented hip will give you an idea about the extent of the bone loss not only the level of the bone loss but even the extent of the bone loss and the remaining bone stock actually dictates the reconstructive options that are available and the type of implant that one needs to use in these given situations obviously the best uh, uh, evidence that we have to assess or to plan our uh, Uh, revision is the radiograph and that gives us an idea about the component position the loosening the location and the degree of lysis the amount of bone that is left behind for us to implant the revision implant all that is uh, gives us a fair idea in a good uh, well taken ap and lateral x ray of the femur in certain situations uh, ct will be quite useful and in some centers uh, particularly if there is uh, uh, any doubt about infection bone scan and pet scan uh, can also be undertaken of course it goes without saying that any uh, revision case 
particularly if there's any uh, slightest hint of uh, infection, you need to go through the entire rigmarole of evaluating thoroughly, including uh, routine bloods as well as uh, hip aspiration to get a fair idea. Ultimately, the goal in uh, femoral component revision are to achieve rotational component stability and axial component stability so that the uh, longevity of the uh, components are ensured. That is ensured by achieving proper hip biomechanics. So that is the ultimate aim in revision uh, hip arthroplasty. However, coming to the challenges, one of course I mentioned about infection, but what we are dealing with today is mainly the bone loss. What is left over and what is the integrity of the bone that is left behind? That is what we need to take into account. But of course, in India, in any given situation, the finances also come into uh, uh, play. So in certain individuals, we need to probably uh, cut our cloth according to the uh, patient. Coming to the classification, we are all familiar with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons classification, uh, which is segmental, cavitatory, or combined. But most of us uh, are uh, using the Paprosky classification, which gives us an idea about the location, whether it is metaphyseal or diaphyseal bone loss, what is the degree of bone uh, that is left behind to support the implant, whether it is in the soft bone, that is the metaphysis, or in the diaphysis. And what is the uh, amount of isthmus that is remaining? How much of purchase can your uh, implant have in the diaphyseal location? So this classification is the most widely used one. And I think even in comparative studies, this uh, is very useful. There, of course, is another classification which I'm not too familiar with, but for the completion's sake, it has been uh, talked about. And this is based on the anticipated bone stock following implant removal. So on table, probably it gives you a better idea what you need to do, but uh, I'm not familiar with this classification. Coming back to the Paprosky classification, the, in type one, there is very minimal uh, proximal metaphyseal bone loss and the metaphysis as well as of course the diaphysis is totally intact. Coming to the type two, there is significant proximal metaphyseal bone loss, but the diaphysis is absolutely intact. Type 3 is divided into 3A, where in 3A, there is more than 4 centimeters of isthmus for us to get a good fit of your uh, femoral uh, diaphysial implant. In 3B, there is less bone in the diaphysis, so you need to think of what would be the best uh, implant in that given situation. And in type 4, there is total loss of bone in the meta as well as in the diaphysal regions. So this is a fairly easy uh, classification to follow. And it gives us a very good uh, working idea as to the uh, type of revision or the type of implant that one would need in a given situation. Like uh, has been uh, mentioned, in type 1, there is very little bone loss. However, often it can be underestimated. The bone loss can be underestimated. Particularly, we may lose a lot more bone when we remove the implant. So what may look like type 1 may end up with being a type 2. That's why I think in the initial stages, uh, the results were not so good with the implants that we had. In type 2, the metaphysal bone loss is significant, but the diaphysis is intact. And there is some amount of remodeling of the proximal femur. 3A, like has been mentioned, there is significant metaphyseal bone loss, but the diaphysis, there is more than four centimeters of the isthmus remaining for us to get a good fit of our uh, long stem implant. In type 4, there is much more significant bone loss and there is very little bone distal to the uh, isthmus for us to get a good fit. And in type 4, there is uh, a massive bone loss both, both in the meta as well as in the diaphyseal region. So that's uh, the main uh, classification that we use. Now coming to the options that we have, a lot of implants in the uncemented version, you can have proximally coated, you can have proximal modular implants, extensively coated prox uh, both 
uh, long as well as short stem implants, tapered, which can be non modular or modular, and mega, mega processes. In the cemented, you can use uh, standard implants if you do a well, uh, I mean, good impaction grafting, or you can use allografts and do cement, uh, I mean, uh, impaction grafting. And you can do a combined procedure. So you have a lot of options depending on your training and your experience. You could opt, and also in the given clinical scenario, you can utilize one of the above procedures. Just for an idea, this is a proximally uh, proporous coated and generally used in type 1, but the eight year, I mean, follow up has not been great, probably because some amount of underestimation of the bone losses uh, has been uh, done in the earlier stages. So nowadays, people have moved on to the modular uh, processes that we have, like the SROM implants that we have. This is the one that is more in uh, preference nowadays. And this has a much better outcome, both in the type one, as well as in the type two Petrovsky uh, classification that has been there. So there is a specific metaphyseal sleeve with a slotted diaphyseal segment. And the important thing is both the offset as well as the version can be adapted on table, depending on your uh, trial that you perform on the table. So that can be uh, slotted in at that time. And this has had excellent uh, results. Uh, this is a very old follow-up, but I'm sure that there are a lot more uh, reports of better uh, success in the recent uh, times. We have extensively porous coated implants and uh, up until now, this has been the workhorse for mainly the type 2 and 3A femoral bone loss. And uh, most of us are familiar with this and uh, you have the straight ones uh, and for longer eight and 10 inches, you have the board stem as well, depending on the conformity of the diaphysis. And long-term results have been uh, very good. Even in uh, uh, 3B, if the canal diameter is less than 18 mm, I think they have done well. So this has been the workhorse implant for most revisions and uh, uh, up until now, I am also very familiar with this type of implant. There are uh, the uh, Wagner type of implants, the non-modular tapered stem. This is now the in thing. Um, of course, uh, the modular ones are more preferred now, but these the non-modular tapered stems are actually performing much better than the fully coated uh, cylindrical stems that have been in vogue earlier. The only problem is the modular ones have uh, problems of uh, stem fracture, fretting, and corrosion. Whereas that is not the case in this non-modular or the original uh, um, Wagner type of processes that we have had. So this again gives you the, the modular tapered version, gives you the option of uh, titrating the version and the offset on table. So you can restore the hip biomechanics better, you can restore the length better, and the overall results have been much improved with the uh, tapered stems that uh, have been in vogue in the last uh, uh, decade and a half. Coming to the cemented stems, usually combined with impaction grafting when there is bone loss, and it can be done in any type of bone loss, people who are trained in this have excellent outcomes with that. And uh, in the earlier studies, because probably the techniques were not good, the outcomes were uh, variable. But in uh, a Swedish uh, long-term survivorship analysis of almost uh, 1,200 cases, excellent survival at about uh, 15 years, 94% overall survival and 99% for aseptic loosening. That I think is uh, phenomenal. So even in uh, Ex extensive bone loss uh, in selective centers, in well uh, done uh, uh, centers, it does well. So this is just an x-ray from the net to show you how well the uh, infection bone, bone grafting uh, takes up in the long run. This is one where allograft has been used and impaction bone grafting has been done and excellent outcomes in the long run.
coming to massive bone loss in uh, type 4 allograft prosthetic composite has been used uh, i have no personal experience with this type of uh, reconstruction but uh, it is done fairly well uh, results are definitely not as good as in the type 3 up to type 3 but in the in the selective centers they have done well the long stem process is, is cemented into the bulk proximal allograft and then in the distal portion you can do either cemented or preferably uncemented where it is mated to the post bone uh, in a press fit manner so this also can be done mega processes i think we have a case discussion by dr manoj so tumor processes also there is a i think a case so they will talk a little more about it so in very elderly with massive bone loss but the overall survivals are not good and the complications are much higher and should only be considered as a salvage procedure so coming to the take home message i think ct scan is uh, a very good option in particularly type 1 and type 2 because uh, the significant bone loss can be uh, underestimated in a plain X-ray. So CT will be helpful. Uncemented stems are preferred over cemented stems in the average surgeon's hands at least. And modular stems are better than monoblock. Tapered stems are doing better than cylindrical stems nowadays and that is the way to go forwards now. And a well-done cemented stem with impaction bone grafting has been shown to have excellent survivorship. And long-term studies are awaited for newer implant designs. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ajit, for a nice presentation and uh, sticking to time. So this uh, being the first topic and a basic topic, uh, anybody uh, which uh, who can take part in the discussion and uh, um, ask some questions. Anybody from the panelist? Couple of, uh, couple of uh, suggestions, uh, you know, the <clears throat> type one, if you have a good metaphysical bone, then ashram is useful because in the ashram only the sleeve is coated. The stem is grid blasted, so only the sleeve part is coated. So unless you have a good metaphysical hold, one should avoid using ashram. Number one. Number two, in type one, also fully coated stems like you know coral, etc., will be you know, much more useful. Fully coated stems, HA coated coral has got a good uh, you know long-term outcome. And uh, regarding the solution stem, <clears throat> one should avoid using sizes less than 13.5 and more than 19. Less than 13.5, there are you know uh, report case reports of fracture of the stem commonly. And more than 19, the bone ungrowth and ingrowth is very poor. So between 13.5 and 19 is useful. Number three, this Wagner stem has been very useful. I think uh, Dr. Anup will talk to you later also. Wagner stem is extremely helpful. Only thing there are some few incidents about subsidence and uh, there is uh, you know, modularity issues like adjusting version, et cetera, that you can do on the table. Otherwise, it's an excellent stem to use. And finally, in the you know, type four, the Depuy, this reef stem has been useful in our country. In many countries, they don't use it, but uh, we have been using you know, reef stem, reef stem with distal locking and Esculap long stem, also a distal locking stem also has been useful. And of course, the modular stem uh, will get to know the, what is the long-term outcome. And John will tell you the, the you know the technically demanding impacts on bone grafting later on. So we, sh we should not discuss it right now. I think we'll uh, go ahead with uh, the other talks because uh, we the next talks uh, will uh, provide us uh, give an idea about the type of bone loss and in which uh, case what you are using so that we have a good discussion on um, the cases uh, case based discussion so next i will um, invite uh, dr vidya sagar reddy who will be presenting a case on uh, cemented bipolar revision uh, dr vidya sagar reddy please so you can share your screen yeah, good evening everybody Thanks to IAA team for giving an opportunity to present this case. 
This is the case on uh, revision of failed cemented bipolar hemiarthroplasty. As we all know, conversion of failed fibril component into revision THR has a lot of options. The surgeon is uh, confused what to use at what scenario. Definitely, we should have a primary plan and also we should have a backup plan. Coming to case history, 64 years female presented with left hip pain following history of fall at home. She had undergone cemented bipolar hemiarthroplasty eight years back for isenic eye fracture through posterior approach. She was, she was having good ambulatory status before fracture, this fracture. There are no signs of infection clinically and biochemical markers are normal. It happened during peak COVID period. You can see uh, the X-ray showing Vancouver type B3 periprosthetic fracture with the broken stem with the cemented bipolar processes in situ. May I get an opinion from the faculty what best can be done by them? You can go ahead uh, with the presentation, yeah. then we'll discuss. Okay, yes. okay sir. So you can see uh, uh, by looking at X-ray uh, lateral view, you can see the anterior femoral moving also. This is what we have to observe. So now the issues uh, uh, in this case being uh, definitely uh, astabular side is uh, straightforward and the femoral side we have a lot of issues. So there are surgical issues and technical issues. Issues being uh, one is the abductor insufficiency due to uh, greater trochanter avulsion and there is the osteopenia in the proximal part. There is a comminuted fracture in the proximal part and there is a, a, a bone loss. So definitely a technical problem being the availability of all implants for this revision total hip replacement at the district center during this peak COVID period. And that too, if you want to come in two companies like the one on the femoral side and one on the osteopenic side, it is a, uh, definitely it is a problematic issue, getting all the implants at the right time. So as we all know, uh, the posterior approach is, approach is the extensile approach. But I am more familiar with Hardin's approach for total hip replacement. And that too, considering the periprosthetic fracture, I, I went uh, through Hardin's approach. So definitely the fixation can be uh, done for fracture by SSYs or cables or cable plate system or with locked plates. There may be a need of a structural allograps or strut props. So coming to my planning, the primary plan was to use a digitally fitting stem of Wagner and uncemented astabular cup and fixation of the fracture with the SSYs. I had backup plan having dual mobility cup and having a locked plates, digital femoral locking plates to use a lengthy one also and provision of getting bone graft. So femoral side, so these are the implants uh, which are useful like uh, a solution stem or Wagner or uh, modular tapered titanium stem for this case. So solution stem, it is a cobalt chromium uh, made. It is cylindrical in shape, fully porous coated. Uh, available sizes being eight, nine and 10 inches. So eight inches is a straight one and whereas nine and 10 inches are uh, uh, bowed one. So definitely there is a concern about the proximal stress shielding with the solution stem. So the literature says uh, there is implant breakage uh, with uh, less than 13.5 mm and more than 18 mm diameter uses of stems. So there is a concern about intraoperative fracture while using these type of stems. So there is a good survivorship uh, uh, analysis with uh, this stem for revision total hip replacement especially type 1, 2, type 3A defects. When you come to Wagner stem, it has a, a good track record. Uh, having conical shape, it gives more contact between the prosthesis and the bone. With the tapered nature, it gives more axial stability. As it is made up of titanium, it gives good load transmission to the bone. It is grid blasted. It has eight fluted ribs. Because of it, it gives good rotation stability. There is also... Uh, the uh, version can be adjusted easily to some extent. The size just starts with 190 length. There is a concern about subsidence of uh, Wagner stem in literature. So 
So definitely, uh, when you use uh, uh, inappropriate diameter stem, probably the substance may be more. So we need to use a properly fitting shorter stem with a good diameter. So that is uh, useful. Considering modular tapered titanium stem, these are all especially useful in type 4 fibrosity defects like purpose, reclaim, or restoration from strike gap. So there is a concern about uh, fatigue fracture and corrosion with this type of implants, especially, especially in obese patients. So for this case, uh, Ashtabler side, uh, uh, as we know, uh, cemented or uncemented cups, and definitely there is a role of dual mobility cup when you want to decrease the chances of dislocation, especially in uh, uh, abductor insufficiency cases. Though I have not templated properly with the micro stem, uh, I used the Horus software just to calculate uh, the appropriate length of the stem that I'm going to use and also the appropriate diameter in which I knew that 190 is okay up to bow, bowing of this, uh, this one. And also the inner cartilage diameter, I thought it is 15. So even if, uh, if I calculate the ribs of this Wagner, I can go up to 17. I did a blue hot in the approach, I went inside. So there was difficult dislocation of hip due to fracture and broken stem. Uh, there was no evidence of intraoperative infection. So uh, difficult removal of cement mantle was there, especially when removing the digital broken part of the processes. When I removed the cement from the proximal part, the proximal part was so much osteoporotic and uh, there was a gap at fracture site. Ashtabular ribbing was done, provisional manual reduction of fracture femur done. Uh, it is a uh, useful tip to put prophylactic SSY to the fracture, especially when you are doing digital uh, fitting stems. I reamed up to 16 Wagner. I checked under C arm, and that was sufficient for me. Uh, I cannot go more than that uh, considering the boundness of the femur. I thought, okay, it is uh, appropriate 190. So finally, uh, I went, uh, I did striker MDF dual mobility cup. Uh, with uh, shell size 48, with the liner 38 and 22 head, uh, with Wagner stem of 17 diameter and 190 length. So there was a comminuted fracture gap with the gap with large length of greater to end. I don't want to take any risk uh, in this particular case, especially during this COVID period. I don't want to get any complication, especially dislocation. I thought I can give you a recent fixation. Uh, uh, for uh, uh, and not to go for uh, non-union of uh, trochanter or fracture. I thought I can give a good result fixation. Hence, uh, I went uh, uh, ahead with the uh, application of digital, reverse digital femoral locking plate uh, with good stability. Somehow, uh, one screw is just digital to the tip of the prosthetic stem, uh, which was found at final CRM image. Uh, to fill the gap, I used a cancellous bone graft from the earlier crest. Clinically, there was no limb length discrepancy. I have put the patient uh, on teriparatide for three months. This is the immediate post-op X-ray uh, showing a good uh, snug fit of the uh, Wagner stem of around six centimeters with uh, rigid fixation of the fracture. And you can see, you can notice SS wire just distal to the fracture. This is the uh, six months uh, follow-up X-ray showing good uh, bone remodeling. Thank you for giving an opportunity. Uh, I would like to know uh, from the uh, senior faculty what best could have been done for this case from their view. Thank you, Dr. Reddy, for uh, keeping it uh, in time. So, um, uh, Dr. Rajiv, Dr. Rajiv, uh, would, I, would you have done something different in this case because there was a uh, subtrochantric fracture? Thank Dr. Rajiv, are you there? Uh, I, I think it is done very well in mm -hmm. the given circumstances. The only thing that uh, probably should have been uh, either the proximal most screw in the distal fragment is very close to the implant, femoral implant. But I think it's a very well done surgery and the follow up results are very good. In uh, uh, my case presentation, uh, I'll show you two very interesting cases. Uh, where the proximal osteolysis happens and what happens if you don't do enough bone grafting and enough support proximally. So, uh, would have been a modular implant better in this in this case because there is a subtrochantric fracture 
and uh, uh, this uh, monoblock implant would have is uh, a stiff implant and uh, chances of uh, subsidence even axial subsidence is more and that breakage of this distal screw is more yeah, is that right. uh, possibility yes is very right the modular would have been better but i think in the given circumstances uh, dr reddy has done a good uh, dr john um, dr john uh, would, I, would you have done uh, uh, what you have done in uh, as a cemented method in this case in your um, case no i don't think this would be appropriate for cemented fixation and certainly for um, impression grafting it would not be the case it's a very comminuted proximal femur yeah. There's very little uh, calcar there, a lot of bone stock loss. So it'd be very difficult to create a tube for impaction grafting. And uh, I never cement uh, femoral components without impacted graft in the revision scenario. So I think I would have used a, a modular tapered uh, stem in, in this case as well. Yeah, Dr. Reddy, I have a question. Is that okay? Um, and it's a question to the other panelists also. Uh, the plate which you have used uh, as a proximal femoral locking, uh, or is a distal femoral you have up done upside down, is it? It is the distal femoral locking plate. Yeah, so you've done upside down. Okay, fine. So that's, uh, it's just the trochanter itself was so comminuted. Uh, I don't know how much hold you have from the screws actually inside the trochanter. So there are special plates available like a claw plate or a, you know, a prong plates which you can use. And it's a component of the cable ready grip system from Zimmer. The only trouble is it's very expensive and it adds to a lot of expense. So I'm just wondering, does the faculty have any other plates which are available, something similar, which can be used in this circumstances where you do have to uh, wire back the trochanter apart from the circular wiring itself? Uh, frankly Tell speaking, I would not have used a plate only. Yeah, that's it. I would have used a longer stem you know, two cortical diameter distal to the distal most fracture site. And uh, then I have done uh, bone grafting and wiring uh, um, around the stem. That would have served the purpose. Uh, was there any need of putting such an extensive uh, doing it? Well, that's for the surgeon to decide. But uh, yeah. I think Dr. Reddy felt that something had to be done about the trochanter. I would have yeah. done a wearing of uh, trochanter. I found a large chunk of greater trochanteric fragment with severe osteoporosis. I, I had a good place to put uh, many screws and it's a habit for me to keep a 14 and a 16 hold digital femoral locking plates right and left for any uh, bipolar or totally replacement standby. Uh, considering uh, my native place, uh, a, a district center uh, where I cannot get all the implants. Uh, uh, so I have a habit of keeping that. So uh, I am much experienced with this type of fixation. Just an observation yes, on this case. Can I make a comment? Yes. Sir. Um, looking at the lateral view, there's one lateral view on the extreme right. The tip of the prosthesis is almost abutting on the cortex there. So if you have a longer stem, probably you may have had to do an osteotomy there. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. The, hence, I, I just uh, kept in mind and I uh, stopped at that level. And the 17 diameter diagonal stem was... Uh, uh, as good as scratch fit on this scenario. Okay. Okay. Can I make a comment? Yeah, yeah. Ranub, you can go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, we can't challenge that. Obviously, uh, the post op x ray shows the union. But then, what we're trying to do here is two procedures one is arthroplasty procedure, and another is osteosynthesis procedure. While the principle of reconstruction in these cases is that you can should be able to separate bone and create osteosynthesis. So the stem is longer. So in this case, you have to take a bold stem. In Wagner, it's not available. So you have to take a modular stem. The modularity of the stem will achieve osteosynthesis. So you don't need an extra plate. And in modular stem, longer stem is bold. So you, whenever you take two plus stem, it's a bold stem. So the point I'm trying to make here is that your reconstruction procedure should be with modular stem, ideally in such cases, which should also achieve bone union. I have a question to the faculty. Uh, considering the bowing of the femur, how do you do osteotomy of the fragment in this fracture scenario? Do you do really? If you want to go more the uh, uh, 
distal to the boat stem. If you take there are boat stems. Boat stems. Uh, Doctor Reddy, I don't think that osteotomy is needed. Yes. Uh, you could have used a little longer stem, uh, 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 anterior board stem, uh, and modular stem is a good idea. The board stem. Do you think that uh, uh, to Anup, I'll say that osteosynthesis in this kind of a scenario will be needed because unless the proximal bone uh, bone uh, becomes stronger, the stress shielding will remain a problem. And uh, in future, the stem may break, even the stronger stem. Okay, sir. We are uh, yeah, we are just uh, one point. I was also mm -hmm. agreeing with Dr. Mohanty. We can use a longer stem, and I have had few cases with multiple circlage mm -hmm. wires also. Even if it doesn't oppose fully, mm -hmm. finally the bone heals. But this is a good result. Whatever Dr. Reddy has got. Yeah, but yeah, we'll move ahead. We'll yeah, move we'll go. We'll go move ahead uh, with the uh, case presentation. So uh, I will again request uh, all the faculty to stick to time because uh, we have limited time and many speakers, so that we uh, finish in time. So next speaker is Dr. Bijay Singh, who will be presenting on a case of multiple revision. Uh, Dr. Bijay Singh, please, can you share your screen? While Dr. Singh is sharing the screen, there is a question from the YouTube by Dr. Nipun Rana uh, that uh, how do we decide on the stem length uh, in such cases? Literature says minimum four centimeters scratch fit needs to be there in the isthmus. I think we have answered that, and Dr. Jurani has told you uh, about the modular stem. So at least you know two cortical diameters distal to the you know last uh, fracture site. Uh, you should decide that should be approximate length of your stem. Yeah, let's go ahead with Dr. Singh's presentation. So I like to thanks all the faculty and the family to make me give the opportunity to present the case. I would like to present the case of 75 year old female who had a uh, previous history of uh, revision of bipolar to total hip replacement by some other surgeon. This is the only X-ray, I will uh, beg a pardon. So this is the only X-ray with me uh, uh, of previous uh, to that. Patient had a history of cemented bipolar for fracture neck in 2005. And she underwent total hip replacement with cement on cement stem. And probably there was an attempt to remove a cement through a lateral cortical window. And, uh, and after once the patient started mobilizing in April 2014, it, she developed a fracture shaft of femur after six months. With a trivial fall. So should I go ahead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. please. Good. At this point, we thought that the stem is well fixed and uh, it is cemented. And uh, probably at the same uh, time, we just fixed the uh, fracture with a claw plate, DTR hook plate of Zimmer with autogenous iliac crest bone grafting done at the lateral cortex. And we wired multiply. Only problem was that we were not able to put in uh, proximal screws in uh, in this case. After four months of last surgery, as, it, as we started mobilizing, uh, probably there was a loss of reduction. Probably there was no rotational stability uh, provided with the problem plate. Finally, finally, at this stage, we thought that the stem, even the stem, started becoming loose. And we extracted the stem, previous stem. Uh, we inserted a long uh, proximal, after splitting the proximal femur to extract the stem, we added a long proximal femur, proximal femur reconstruction was in, even after. And this is the X-ray after 15 months of reconstruction. We have inserted a fibula and did an autogenous iliac crest bone grafting for this case. But there was no signs of union even after 15 months after the patient was started on teriparatide and was ambulating on partial weight bearing. At this point, we decided that we will do dynamization for the screw removal of static screw removal and contralateral fibula only bone graft was added. And at two years follow up, finally she achieved union and she is ambulating. I know this will generate a lot of controversies and uh, there was a uh, limb line discrepancy of two centimeters in this case. Uh, this is open for discussion with other faculties. Yeah. Uh, 
Dr. Vijay, first question to you itself. What did you learn from this case? Hmm? First question is to you yourself. What did you learn from this case? Yeah, for me, probably uh, planning with CT scan, initial CT scan would have been better uh, while doing my previous, my first surgery, while fixing the uh, implant, probably would have helped me. And uh, secondly, the uh, fitting stems may be used in this kind of case scenarios. Okay, I think I'll let the other faculty pitch in before I give you my opinion. Mm. The important thing about this was at this stage, the, a long stem should have been used, I think. You were never going to get stability with a single plate on the lateral cortex. Okay. So I think there should have been an Absolutely. intervention at this time. And if for any reason you can't use a long stem, then it needs either two plates or a plate and a strut graft. You simply can't rely on one plate with a transverse fracture like this. I think primarily you should have done the last surgery. You should have taken out everything and put a long stem there along with, uh, because it's a cemented inside and uh, you know the bone is sclerotic, uh, you could have used fibula graft. Primarily if you could have done the last surgery, then probably it would have been successful. But uh, anyway, you have got away with that and uh, you have done excellent results with the fibula strut graft. That is very good. Uh, just a couple of things, Vijay. So the uh, what Dr. Temple is saying that you cannot use just the plate uh, in a fracture with a periprosthetic fracture. So it has to be either with a bone graft on the other opposite side, or, or there was a debate about using two bone grafts or one graft and plate or two plates and a bone graft. So that is a different debate. But I think the commonest combination we use is a plate and a bone graft. Uh, the question is when you used a stud graft in fibula towards the end, last case, you used it on the outside, I think, isn't it? On the lateral cortex. Yeah. So again, the bone graft, I think the recommendation is to use on the inner cortex uh, because you want to, again, prevent the bone. So you want the bone generation happening and actually helping you to straighten out your femur. So we have done uh, twice fibula grafting in this patient. The first fibula was done on the initial surgery when we did the uh, uh, first time uh, uh, inserting that uh, long locking nail. The proximal segment was communicated while we are uh, right. trying to extract the stem. At the same time, we inserted fibula. We did the ipsilateral bone grafting or contralateral bone grafting autogenous select crest. And like this extra picture is after 15 months of then the, when the bone started resorbing. I don't have the initial uh, in between x-rays. So I think if you're a trauma surgeon, you realize that this was dynamization requiring. Did the estabulum needed a revision? Because no, not the long stem. Uh, would have been the best choice uh, at the first first uh, first uh, revision. Absolutely. Okay. Thank oh, you, Dr. Vijay. So we'll go ahead. Uh, we'll uh, go to the next uh, case presentation uh, by Dr. Rajiv Sharma. Uh, it's a case on moderate to severe defect. Uh, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, uh, me? Yeah. Okay. One minute. I'll just share the screen. Yeah. Call from zero eight eight seven. Can you can you see my screen, please? No, we can see, but uh, your presentation is going out of screen. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Can, can I just take a few minutes and you can take up another case? And then I'll... No, it's fine. It's fine. It's, it's come, Rajiv. Come in? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. So I'll be discussing uh, two cases. Uh, one uh, case, I'll just present three slides. And the first one is uh, quite interesting. And that's how the patient, this patient's story started. He had a, a basal uh, uh, intercapsular neck femur. The DHS was done and which failed. 
and then uh, the cemented uh, total hip was done. Uh, the to control, as you see here, uh, the wires uh, were used to fix it up, and uh, this way the patient uh, uh, was doing okay in the post-operative period. And then after, patient had a fall. And when he had a fall, uh, there was a fracture, uh, uh, which, you, which we can see. And this was a well-cemented stem. Uh, at the time of revision, the removal of stem was simple because it was a fra big, la large fragment of fracture. Uh, I used the solution stem. Those days, solution stem was quite common in our country. And uh, I used the cables, three cables I used to fix. And uh, that's how the patient's uh, uh, post-operative uh, X-ray or with the, uh, with the, after the revision. Solution stem, it was uh, reasonably well fixed distally. These fragments were looking uh, strong and the fixation was looking very strong. Uh, any comment at this stage? I'll go on. Uh, patient started walking with the, and then also with the help of a stick. At nine months follow-up X-ray, uh, we could see that the all was not okay, and the proximally we could see that the at the site where the cable was fixed, probably the cable was too tight, so it it caused a fracture. Uh, in the in this in this area, at one year, the cables were looking broken, and we were following this patient very meticulously. You see that the at one year the distal stem was well fixed, proximal it was not okay. We did a uh, bone grafting at this stage. Uh, thinking that, okay, fine, the bone grafting may take up and then a uh, lot of crust bone graft were used. But at one year and eight months, when the patient came in emergency, he came with a dislocation. And in this dis dislocation obviously happened because the, glute, the, the abductor mechanism had failed because of the complete proximal osteolysis. And this was a, was a uh, tough situation. The, the, the solution was very well fixed distally. And that's why I thought of using the, uh, keeping the prosthesis and just use the fibula. Uh, and we used the fibular graft uh, in the proximal fragment and kept the patient uh, immobilized for significant, uh, about three months. And then the patient was allowed to walk. At one year uh, post-operative after the surgery, patient stumbled and had a fall. And at this time, we could see that the solution stem uh, has, and obviously this was the, uh, the spot, which was the stress spot, and that's how it, it got broken. And that's how we see that the, uh, the stem is well fixed, but not just this, we see that the uh, osteoporotic fracture in proximal tibia as well, uh, which had united uh, on its own. And at this time, the only thought was to uh, remove this, uh, the distal fragment, which was a big, big difficult uh, process. And those of my colleagues who have used the uh, solution, uh, removed the broken solution stem, they will agree with me that this is a very solid stem and becomes like uh, one with the bone. So it was a very tough process to remove this bone. And that's how uh, we ended up using the uh, tumor prosthesis in this patient. That's at five years. We see that some bone formation in this area. And this is the patient who's walking at five years. All right. I'll just quickly show three more slides, which may be very interesting. Another patient with a dysplastic hip, somebody did a femur without the subtrochanteric osteotomy, and he shattered the proximal femur. Uh, this was not only the shattered proximal femur, but also the infection. Here we use the long uh, two-stage revision, a long cemented prosthesis, and later on, uh, tumor prosthesis with a constrained liner. Uh, that, that's all from my side. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajiv. I think this, uh, this case of yours 
shows all the drawbacks of a extensively poroscoted uh, implant yes that is like a solution implant so it shows that uh, it can break when it is uh, of lesser diameter it shows that the, it will be uh, act, mane, it's not a distal fitting it, it has to be fixed uh, throughout it is extensive poroscoted so it has to be fixed everywhere so that there will be not much of virus uh, remodeling so uh, anybody uh, who has any comment on this case sir yeah, could i make a point if we could go back to the original um, the original fracture please can we just go back and look at the slides of the original fracture yeah, yeah. oh yeah no uh, the one where you put the with the cemented um, uh, c stem in place okay oh uh, yeah because at this point you say that it was well fixed and um, i think there would have been an opportunity here to have um, done an in-cement revision. You would need a long stem. So you would work through the fracture site to go distal to, to the stem. But I think you could then use a burr to burr down the, the cement in the proximal femur. But I would certainly have um, revised this with an in-cement technique to a longer stem and then wired that uh, proximal femur around. So leaving the biological interface intact. And I think that would have... Um, I mean, part of the problem was using a distally fixed stem, but that if there was some cement left in the proximal femur, it was never going to heal to it. But I think if the cement is well fixed, we try to leave it intact and do an, what's, you know, an in-cement revision. And if the character of the fracture requires make, putting in a longer stem, then cementing in a longer one, but leaving the cement in the proximal femur intact. Uh, John, I yeah. think that's a very good solution. Uh, my only worry will be, which uh, maybe you, you can clarify to us, that when you put a longer cemented stem, uh, the C stem, long C, C stem can be used. My always the worry is the fractured fragment, the cement will seep into the fracture, uh, uh, fra fra fractured area. And this will be a hindrance for union of the bone. So what do you do in such a case? Well, I know that is the received wisdom, but I can tell you of the periprosthetic fractures that we get, and don't forget in the United Kingdom, the Exeter and the collars polished tapered cemented stones are by far the most implanted. So it's not an uncommon thing to happen. Uh, we, we do in cement revisions and the beauty of leaving the cement in on the fragments is that when you put the jigsaw together, the jigsaw uh, uh, approximates very closely and very little if any cement get, actually gets into the fracture. So it, it actually allows a more accurate um, reduction of the jigsaw. Uh, so if it comes out in one or two places, I don't think it matters. But with this case, you could work through the fracture. You have to use a high-speed burr to thin the cement in order to get the geometry of the longer stem down. And in this case, clearly, you'd need to go through that distal cement. Uh, but I think that might have been an option at this time, uh, because then it would be fairly easy to, to wire, to cable the, that fragment around the proximal femur, and you have the distally, distal fixation of the cemented stem as well. And and that might have been an option at this, at this point. John, uh, I have a question. You know, you have a distal that is a hiding restrictor there. And uh, how will you make a burr and, you know, through that restrictor, you have to pass a long stem. Uh, you have to take out that restrictor as well, isn't it? You do. You can just push it down. Um, no, no, you can just push that down. Well, I mean, you've got a fracture right down to the tip here. So with a high-speed burr, I think you could do it in a direct vision. If it's slightly further up, we have an OSCE, you know, the ultrasound cement removing a piece of yeah. kit. To take yeah. that cement out. Um, but I think you can do it under direct vision. But you need a sebatome or an ANSPAC or something like that. Uh, and you require, you know, thinner stem than this to do a cement in cement, correct? Well, you have to... Long. Yeah, you have to use a well. You'd have to template it, and um, it would the one within the. I don't know the C stem um, uh, system, but with ours, uh, probably a two hundred five stem would be the one that you could get down here. You'd need to template it, and you need to use the high speed burr to make space proximally. If there wasn't in this case enough space, then I think it probably would be an option to fix the fracture, leave the cement in, do an in cement revision around a shorter stem, and actually fix it as we were talking about with uh, probably two plates or a plate and a strut graft. But if that cement was well fixed, I, I think the bottom line of what I'm saying is if there is an opportunity to leave the cement and it's well fixed, then do that and address the fracture would be the way we would uh, approach it. That's uh, just one, one question. You, all these things happened within a year. I mean, the massive disappearance of proximal bone, 
uh, all throughout a year. I mean, we have read that uh, the solution is actually a copy of the AML processes and the <laughs> AML primary process went out of production purely for this reason that it was fixing distally and proximally there was bone lysis. But, and that is why the solution then came only for revisions. But now we are seeing that even in revisions, if you don't have proximally well fitting onto the, the bone, if the bones are not fitting well to this, they actually start getting resorption. But one year, so much resorption. I mean, is there something else going on? I mean, that's what yeah. I'm wondering. What, what was your uh, you one talk, year? Uh, uh, it was it, it was one year and eight months almost. And before we go on, uh, John, can I ask you one question? When you use a longer cemented stem, do yes. you use the bone graft as well? Outside? No, not normally. Um, we're using a longer cemented stem for an in cement fixation. You wouldn't normally use bone graft. No, you'd reduce the fracture. If you need to put ex external fixation, possibly so, but depending on the character of the fracture, if you bypass it and cable it up. So if we had been able to get a longer stem, several core, um, diameters beyond this, I would have been happy to cement the whole thing in. So it's cemented down the whole length right. uh, and cable it up. Right. Uh, you about Rajiv, what you said, this patient had a, a, a one and a half years, uh, one year and eight months. This was at one year. And then we see uh, bone grafting was done at this time. And that, any, then any intra picture, one year and eight months. Any intra picture during no. the tumor prosthesis? Uh, yeah, I, we must be yeah. having. Were there, but, were there metallosis or anything? No, because metallosis is very common in this no. type of extensive uh, porous coated implants. Yes, but there was no metallosis in this uh, case. Uh, and uh, uh, we have sent the many uh, cultures also to rule out the possibility of infection. Uh, so it was uh, not uh, an infect infection as well. I think it is well known that uh, especially the cemented, the, the solution stem, uh, which are well fixed distally, they do cause uh, um, in the literature there is a uh, some cases are reported where there is a severe osteolysis, uh, spontaneous osteolysis proximally because the very strongly fixed stem uh, distally and all stress shielding. Rajiv, I've, I've had this picture on your right, uh, quite a few cases of. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, solution but you know they are like seven eight years down the line what i'm really worried is that year and uh, even this picture which you're showing is just a one year uh, yes. massive and then the year and eight months there's nothing left of proximal femur absolutely right yes yes but you very, never very, grew very, it and, and not only this you see this patient had a very severe uh, osteoporosis you see that he had a, a proximal uh, tibial fracture as well well, I think he's waiting for a total femoral replacement at some stage, yeah. along with the stem TV. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajiv, for a nice presentation of the case. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'll stop here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then uh, we'll go ahead with uh, our next uh, talk uh, by our guest faculty, because we know that uh, when a type 4 or a type 3B uh, as such a case, a difficult case comes with a femoral bone loss, then uh, we are uh, in a different uh, situation. We are in a fix. So uh, sometimes impacts and bone grafting is a solution to that. So we have uh, the master in uh, here. So I request uh, uh, Dr. John Temperley to present on uh, this impacts and bone grafting, the surgical uh, technique and the outcome. Over to you, sir. And I request Dr. Rakesh Rajput to take over from uh, next uh, uh, case. Devrata Padi, Dr. Padi, you're doing absolutely fine. <laughs> no, no, Just mean, carry you on. Take, you have to take your part. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much uh, for your invitation to the Indian Arthroplasty Association and for uh, giving me the honor of presenting to you. So what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about is the use of bone graft in these uh, cases. And we know from the results that have been mentioned earlier uh, by Dr. Kumar that uh, the results of femoral impaction grafting around the world have been good. So this case from Nijmegen in Holland gave a follow-up 15 to 20 years with a re-revision rate um, uh, with aseptic loosening at the, at the end point of very, very high, 100%, um, and for any femoral re-revision at 96%. So we know that it can be used safely in the hands of many surgeons. So in this presentation, I'd like to really discuss when is femoral impaction graft useful 
And really that is when there's loss of trabecular bone within the femur. In other words, there's a cavitary defect where you can't get good fixation with cement. You could use an uncemented device, but uh, it, the whole thing about infernal impaction is that it puts bone graft in back into the patient. So when is more complex in impaction grafting indicated? It's where there's loss or damage of cortical bone. If you do an extended trochanteric osteotomy, then you can certainly use impaction, impacted graft and in the case of periprosthetic uh, fracture. And really the aims are to recreate the bio native biomechanics. And one of the beauties of course, is because you are using a stem of this sort, you can get offset leg length and version right because you are cementing into a, a, a bed of bone graft. You get proximal femoral loading because of the tapered shape of the implant. And then you get restoration of bone stock. And it's been well shown radiologically and histologically that both cortical and trabecular bone reconstitutes. So as an overview of this presentation, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the use of the long stem, uh, use of the proximal meshes, and um, then look at uh, the extended trochanteric osteotomy and uh, femoral impaction grafting uh, with a femoral fracture. So with the long stem impaction grafting, uh, the indications are really where there's cortical bone loss or thinning at the, at the bottom end of a normal length uh, stem. So an endoclinic three or four bone stock loss. And of course, if you've taken the side off the femur with an extended trochanteric osteotomy, you'd be best to bypass that uh, osteotomy with a long stem. And as we have been discussing with uh, fractures, really very often it's best to bypass the whole fracture area into good bone distally if the fracture is either transverse, short oblique, or a comminuted in the proximal femur. And in the Exeter uh, range of stems, which is the one that I'm used to using, uh, there are stems, the ones that are fully tapered are 205 millimeters in length, and they come of two different offsets. And then there are stems that are 220, 240, and 260 millimeters in length. They all have 44 millimeter offset, and are based on the throat size three. So obviously the middle portion of these stems is uh, cylindrical. Now, those of you who've done impassion grafting know that there are instruments that have been made uh, to do this. And the whole idea is that you impact bone down the canal over a wire using these distal packers up to the so-called distal impaction line, which is where you then start using the phantoms and then use these proximal phantoms, which are the same shape as the implant except they allow for a cement mantle on top of that. Uh, and then you do some proximal packing. So right at the top, uh, use hand packers to make sure you get torsional stability of the implant by packing front and back. And then you cement into that bed of impacted allograft chips. Now, of course, with the long stem, you actually have to make an area for that cylindrical portion. So what we have is a coring device. And this coring device passes down over the guide wire into this well-packed distal uh, allograft bone. And you take out a core, a core of bone that allows uh, for the shape of the stem. And then you use a gun and a suck down technique to introduce the polymethyl methacrylate uh, down, suck it down, pressurize it, so that you cement uh, down right to the end of that, uh, that cavity that you formed. So here we have um, a loose uh, uncemented implant on the right that you can see has migrated into varus. And here a mesh has been used in the proximal femur. So you need to recreate a tube and constrain the chips. It was not good in the calcar area, but you can see impacted chips have been used uh, in this area. And again, looking at the Nijmegen group, they've also published on the use of long stems in these more complex cases with a follow-up of five to 16 years all course revision rate 96% with again, no re-revisions for aseptic loosening. And I think that has been the finding in all the centers around the world. If you look, read the literature, the vast majority have not had a problem with mechanical uh, loosening. And uh, from this group here in the clinical orthopedics, uh, 19 years, 93% femoral component survival in the United States. Uh, and then, interestingly from this paper, neither severity of bone loss nor the length of the stem predicted failure. So you, as long as you use the correct technique, you can use this in more significant uh, areas of um, bone stock loss. You do need to recreate a tube of, uh, that you can impact the chips into. 
So most commonly it's the calcar area that's deficient. And here an acetabular rim mesh can be wrapped around the calcar area and held in place with capel and wires. Or for more extensive uh, loss of bone stock in the proximal femur, we have these so-called anatomic meshes where you can use them to wrap them around the proximal femur and they're shaped to go around the calcar and up towards the greater trochanter laterally. And of course you can trim them. So here is a case of uh, a long stem charnley, which you can see is grossly loose uh, with um, lysis all around it and irregular bone. And here you can see uh, that a, a mesh has been used at the top end of the uh, femur to constrain the chips. Can you see these, uh, this amorphous material, which is the bone graft uh, down? And what you find is that the cortex and the trabecular bone recon reconstitutes with the passage of time. And we know from histological uh, papers uh, published from our center, but also from South America, here's the group from Buenos Aires in Argentina, showing that the allograft bone is even vital in areas where there is a metal mesh, metal mesh in the calcar. So the meshes are important, but also it's very good with an extended trochanteric osteotomy if you need to do that. As we've been discussing, you need to bypass the distal part of the fracture or the osteotomy uh, with, uh, by two to three diameters. Use a cable distal to prevent the propagation of the fracture. And then reduce and cable with the appropriate stand, phantom in place so that you know there is space for it. And then the a technique is identical that that I've shown you with the um, uh, coring out over the long stem. And it's important that you get stability. So you do hear people saying they're a bit frightened to hit the allograft bone. But the important thing is you have to have stability so the patient can fully weight bear from day one. So you have to recreate the femur strongly enough that it can, um, that it can do that. And again, you can use proximal meshes and usually put it around uh, after the, you know the position of the stem. So here again is a case that's had a, a osteotomy. You can see here the extended osteotomy, that's where the distal uh, cortical cut was. So the high sole side of this femur has been taken off and then impacting grafting after the, the, um, the femur has been reconstituted. So I'd just like to show you quickly a, a video example of this technique. So you can see again, this is a loose charnley. It's had multiple, multiple previous operations. As you can see, there's a lot of heterotopic bone uh, up in the abductor muscles here. The real trochanter finishes about here, I think. It's been wired on several times. You can predict that there's calcar loss and anterior femoral femur loss from this area. Uh, and as you can see, there's cortical loss down all sides of this femur. So you're going to want to do an extended osteotomy to get the distal cement out. And then uh, we're going to impaction graft it. So in the slide here, we're taking some um, cement over the shoulder of the implant so that we can knock it out without further damaging the, uh, the femur. So the greater trochanter is here. You can see where the foot is. The, as you see, the stem will be burnished anterolaterally and posterior immediately where it's been rotating uh, in the femur. So all of that metal debris has come off there and um, creating part of the lysis. And here we're just taking off some of that heterotopic bone from underneath the abductor musculature. And the good thing about what this was that we were able to use that heterotopic bone and mix it with the allograft bone after we minced it up for the um, impaction grafting. The other thing that you can see clearly here is these wires, which we predicted were there, but you're beginning to see now the top end of the femur, and we're gonna take those wires out uh, as we come across them. Now for the extended osteotomy, we reflect vastus lateralis forwards and then very carefully take off the, uh, the muscle, looking for the perforators and ligating them as we come across them. And then we're going to take off the lateral third of the trochanter, as you can see here. And again, with a cemented implant, after you remove the metal, of course, you can go right through from back to front through the cement at the front uh, without having to expose the femur anteriorly. So you make your distal osteotomy cut and then make sure that you've completed that cut, cut from back to front. And you can see here, I haven't um, completed the osteotomy anteriorly right at the top. So I go forward and do that. And now you can see the whole of the lateral side of the femur has been taken off. And now we can clearly take off all of the soft tissue, take out all of this extra excess cement. And this was the Oscar ultrasound device that I was saying that you can use to take the cement distally. So in this case, we're using Oscar 
to uh, melt the cement. And then as it melts, we can pull it back and, um, and make sure that we've removed all of that distal cement. It's difficult to do uh, with a sieber tome through, through more than three or four centimeters by hand. Now, we, you can see we've got the 260 millimeter long stem down there, and we're just rehearsing being able to close the osteotomy on top of it. And what you generally find is you have to remove a bit of bone in the trochanter in order to close the osteotomy over the shoulder of the implant. And you'll see that in a moment, uh, that we have to burr a little bone from the trochanter. Um, so that's just rehearsing again to make sure you can get that uh, stem in, close the osteotomy, make sure that it approximates. And in that area where my finger is there, that is just holding the osteotomy from closing on the shoulder of the implant. So use a, a burr and remove that. And now before reconstructing the femur, we will pass these cables around. We use one distal to the osteotomy site so that the fracture can't propagate. And then the rest, uh, uh, we put, we'll pass ready four or five of them coming up the femur. We're going to put the plug uh, down on the, uh, on the guide wire to the correct depth. So we've templated, you can see the marks on the, on the guide wire there, how far down the femur we're going to go. We're going to go two centimeters distal to uh, the tip of the greater trochanter, so about 270, 280 millimeters down there. Put the implant down, and now we're going to reduce that fracture over the top of the implant. Because the plug has gone through the isthmus, it will be mobile within the femur. So what we're going to do is skewer the plug with a K wire. So if you put your introducer alongside the, K, the, the guide wire, you know where the plug will be and percutaneously, you can just uh, uh, skewer that uh, plug to make sure that it doesn't move within the femur. Just make sure, you'll take it off at the end, but make sure you don't prang yourself um, and then we're going to reduce that uh, osteotomy uh, with these multiple cables over the top and sequentially uh, tighten them up. So the implant is in there now, the, the long stem phantom. So we know we can get the real stem down and a cement mantle and the graft. And now we'll tighten all these up. And in the proximal femur, we're not going to reconstruct the calcar area until we can see um, where the stem is going to be that, um, and so we can build it up knowing where the, the implant is going to be so that it doesn't impinge. So these Dalmal cables or the Zimmer cables are very useful. Um, and now we're going to start, um, this, we've got to put a mesh proximally. So the way to do that is put a cable round uh, as far laterally as you can, uh, and then from the back to the front, hold the, um, the, what the mesh on with a cable, one above, one below the less trochanter. And now we're using the coring device just to check that it'll go down to make sure that you've got a free run down the femur. And now we're gonna start packing the whole, uh, uh, um, in a moment, we, we're gonna check the distal uh, uh, packers to make, see how far down the canal they will, they will safely go. So you can see that the, these packers we're checking how far down they will go because we don't want to burst, try and burst the femur open. And we're going to use these distal packers to pack those distal chips down onto the plug. So we do that uh, sequentially using two to four millimeter chips. As those are the chips going in, we use the distal packers uh, to pack them down to the proximal impaction line and then the, uh, the larger phantom. So you can see the whole canal is now being filled up with these chips. And then once you get to that distal impaction line, you use the, the, the proximal part of the, uh, uh, the, the phantom to impact the chips proximally. I'll move this on because I know I'm running short of time. So we've packed around the, um, the phantom. There's chips all around that. We've hand packed proximal uh, anterior and posterior. And you have what's a, a neomedullary canal now. So what we do is now squeeze the cement down through a tapered nozzle, suck it down as well as far as you can distally. As the sucker uh, blocks up, remove that, introduce the cement right to the top and then pressurize it. The pressure uh, with the proximal femoral seal, that will force the cement right down to the bottom of the canal and also into the chips. What you don't want to see is cement coming out the osteotomy site. That means you haven't packed it enough and you can see that it isn't coming out. So we know we've packed it and then you'll introduce the stem into that and can do a reduction. 
And so this is where you can see the osteotomy site finished about here. This has got all got chips in it. We've got cement and implant distally, and that was the mesh holding the proximal femur. So the advantages, I think, are low rates of mechanical femur. Pain, the lack of pain is uh, very obvious in these patients. You get preservation of bone stock and enhancement of proximal bone stock. You can recreate the biomechanics very accurately. Uh, the graft is a carrier for antibiotics if you're doing this at the time of a second stage for revision. And I talked a little about instrument revisions. They are what we do in the vast majority of cases. And that remains an option if you ever need to go back into these cases. Uh, so the indications are in patients with loss of bone stock to avoid distal fixation or when an ETO is required, possibly not with the patients with a short-term life expectancy. If there's circumferential bone loss to the mid shaft of the femur, we would certainly wouldn't do it. Uh, and when the surgeon's not trained in the technique, but otherwise I would um, uh, advocate it as, a, uh, as a, a good technique in many of these cases. Thanks, John. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, uh, you use uh, fresh frozen or uh, freeze dried grafts? We use fresh frozen. So we have our own bone bank. Um, yeah. all general heads of patients who are suitable. There's a very strict protocol um, for the U European Tissue Bank of, of things you have to do. So we have to test them for all sorts of diseases. We'll screen them, test them uh, before, and then at 180 days, we freeze it at minus 80. Uh, and then once it's released, uh, we, we wash it and use our own bone graft. You can buy it commercially, but it's quite more expensive, obviously. Yeah, and uh, but there is a possibility of some disease transmission in fresh frozen grafts, correct? As, I've never known it. It's very rare. It's hypothetically possible. Okay, and uh, you take concern from the patient for using fresh frozen grafts, correct? We do. So we consent the donor and we consent the recipient. And we actually feed back to the donor whether their graft has been used. Uh, disease transmission certainly uh, hasn't been an issue. I think if you can use bone graft substitute as well, then there are papers, and we've done it ourselves, where you, if you have tricalcium phosphate or hydroxyapatite that you can buy commercially, those bone graft extenders, the handling characteristics of that are very different. So if you mix it 50-50 with fresh, fresh uh, frozen hour graft, then you can use that as well if, if it's in short supply. Uh, John, okay. you do the uh, frozen graft uh, for about six months and you use it after six months. Is that correct? That's correct. We have to, the patients who we've screened and taken HIV and hepatitis and all those blood tests, we have to check them again to make sure they, those tests are also negative after six months. Right. And then clear the bone for use. Right. It's, it's very, very well shown. And uh, you have shown very well that how the cement will not uh, come into the trochanteric osteotomy uh, between the fracture, the osteotomy uh, fragments and the parent bone. Uh, I think the, with the impaction grafting, it is possible. But without the impaction grafting, probably the cement will seep in. Well, as I was explaining, we, we do a lot of those for periprosthetic fractures. And it, it usually comes out somewhere. But a little tip is if you find an area, if you're pressurizing the cement, around the, where you have left the cement in, you're doing an in-cement revision and you've left the cement down the femur and reduced the fracture. If as you're pressurizing the cement, um, you see it coming out somewhere, don't put a finger on it because the pressure will be so great, it'll come out somewhere else. Allow it to come out in that one place, introduce the stem and then clear it from that one position. But we've not had that as a problem of non-union. And we use the same technique if we do an extended, if we do a subtrochanteric osteotomy, for a crow for femur. Um, we also do, of course, have done an osteotomy there. And um, we've of the, I think we've done 30 cases and we had two cases where there was a problem with union uh, and the rest all healed up. So it's a hypothetical problem, um, but if you can oppose the surfaces uh, very accurately, it's not, we haven't found it to be um, a practical problem. So when you do a subtrochanteric osteotomy, uh, do you use the bone graft at the osteotomy site or do you use the removed part of the bone uh, uh, wrapped around the osteotomy site? No, we don't do either really. I mean, as you know, when, when you do the subtrochanteric osteotomy, it's, it's very difficult to do anything other than a transverse cut because the geometry of the proximal part and the distal part is so different and it's too complicated to do a step cut and the geometry is all wrong. So we tend to do a, 
a transverse cut, derotate the proximal femur, and then you get it as opposed as you can. So there's usually a space where the cement does come out. But the problem is we would love to pack cement on the inside, but there usually isn't space to do that. So most often we don't uh, put any bone graft there, or we may a little, lay a little bit on the outside, but we don't formally bone graft it in, primarily, no. That's actually technically, you know, very demanding. You have to learn the technique of doing impacts and bone grafting, then it becomes really, you know, uh, the results are fantastic. Yes, but for an ET, uh, sorry, for a subtracting um in a crow four femur, obviously we, we don't impact and graft those. There isn't space yeah, to. Yeah, that's great to know. Mm. Thanks. Thanks, John. Well, that's a, that's a very good tip, John, because uh, many of these dysplastic hips, uh, where, where you do a subtrochanteric osteotomy, uh, the, the femoral canal is so small uh, yeah. that putting in a, a cementless a long stem or even a modular stem is a big challenge. So there probably yeah. a cemented stem is a very good option. I would commend it because, of course, with the system I use, with the extra, there's a 30 offset and a 33 as well as 35 offsets. So they're very small offsets. And uh, if you look in the literature, we've written it up from our centre, but also Colin Howey's written this up from Edinburgh. So it, it is described there, and I, I would commend it as a, as a good technique in those cases. I think um, we'll move ahead now. Um, next talk is uh, by Anup, and it's about a case of uh, tumour processes in bone loss in proximal femur. So Anup, all yours, and welcome. Uh, can I ask John before I start? John, your last slide, uh, you're still there, John? Yes, I am. Yeah, sorry. Your last slide showed, uh, you know, two signals of diverted traffic, the opposite. That was a subtle sign for uncemented people to go impaction bone grafting, or it was a classical British sense of humor? <laughs> it was a classical British sense of humor for those using uncemented implants. Don't know which way to go. <laughs> It was actually in my, I came home to my village one day and I, I came to a T-junction. It showed diversion both ways. I didn't know which way to go. Right. <laughs> Great. I think some Irish man made that, is it? <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, I'll uh, just speak about, can you hear and uh, see my slides, Rakesh? I hope I can't see your slides now. I can hear you. All right. So maybe I didn't share. Oh. Yeah, screen share, I think. Yeah, just a minute. Oh. Can you see now? Yeah. yeah, it's visible now. All right. So let's first uh, briefly see the indications for proximal femur tumor prosthesis and arthroplasty. Severe proximal femur bone loss keys more than 5 centimeters from the greater trochanter, especially in the elderly. Post-infective situations, multiple surgeries, where the bone and the soft tissue are compromised. Very important, post-chemo radiation. A lot of elderly patients undergo chemo and radiation where you can't put uncemented stem because they may not ingrow. And periprosthetic fractures, especially in the elderly. Some of the cases we are going to see. But I think the key is this. I'm giving the take-home right at the beginning. Qualitative and quantitative proximal femur bone loss more than five centimeters, which precludes the use of uncemented monoblock or revision stem. This is the primary indication of using a proximal femur tumor prosthesis. Let's see this case. 70 year old lady operated twice for osteosynthesis, infected, so three surgeries, removed four month bags, markers normal, history of breast carcinoma. Now, if you can see the bone loss, the, the bone loss is more than five centimeters, especially uh, analyzing the lateral view from the GT and a wide canal. So this is a high rate of failure, just the, like the case Dr. Rajiv showed. If you put an uncemented stem, it may not ingrow because of history of uh, CA. And there is complete loss of bone. It's been operated three times. So situation is far worse when we go inside. This to me is a very good indication, especially in a patient with comorbidity, 75 plus, you want to mobilize fast. A cemented proximal femur prosthesis is go-to in my hands. It works very well. The only thing is we have to be conscious and cautious about bone cement implantation syndrome. 
ensure the patient is adequately hydrated with CVP more than 10 and give IV steroids to prevent BCIS. Because when you're putting long cemented stems, though this is not a very long uh, cement uh, stem, but still in elderly, especially with cardiac comorbidities, one has to be very careful. And one, has, one can tie the trochanter remains, the abductor part on the HA coat and the holes, as you can see, this is a striker GMRS prosthesis. We're not trying to promote anyone. The fundamental is that this is available both in uncemented, the picture you should, uh, see on the left and the cemented. In elderly wide canal, you'll take a cemented one. The proximal part is HA coated and you wire your GT remnants over it so that the trochanter and the vastus lateralis sleeve is where it is and the chances of instability are low. Another case, 75-year-old operated thrice for fractured neck femur. First with the screws, then with something else, and then finally, and then a periprosthetic fracture. Now, when we go in, the bone loss is far more severe when we remove the prosthesis, we remove the wires, we remove all the cement. It looks something like this. There is hardly anything to reconstruct. There are multiple thin pieces. Once you remove the cement, there is hardly anything. An elderly patient, you want to mobilize fast, in my hands, a modular segmental cemented proximal femur works just fine. You wire the trochanter around, the patient is up and about, and these prostheses have 85% plus 10-year results in this age group. This is the Indian prosthesis also available. Why I'm showing this is that is still cemented one is available. Uh, this is designed actually by one of our colleagues who was supposed to be here. I'm not sure whether Dr. Manish Agarwal is here, but he's one of the designers of this. Mostly he's, used he's already here. He's here. He's here. He's here. All right. So let me acknowledge, first of all, that whatever little I know about proximal tumor prosthesis is from Dr. Manish Agarwal, though I am using mostly for revision complex cases. But anyways, this is the Indian, uh, Indian prosthesis. Uh, we can use it in cemented just as in the case I showed, though it doesn't have a HA part in the proximal area, just like the previous prosthesis we shared. So one indication was complex trauma. Second indication was the case I showed periprosthetic fracture elderly. This is the third case. Again, elderly lady, multiple operated multiple times, rheumatoid arthritis, anemia. She presented with septicemia almost in the, she was in the ICU. And then we have to remove all the implants. It was florid pus and the proximal part was completely necrotic and we had to remove it and put a, put a mega spacer kind of a thing here. I never thought she's going to come back. She was walking, but once everything resolved her, she was good constitutionally. Uh, serology was normal. We reconstructed this with again a tumor prosthesis. And wherever possible, we use a dual mobility, especially where there is no trochanter and the abductors are compromised. A dual mobility along with the tumor prosthesis is a reasonably good option for these patients with comorbidities to mobilize them fast. Because here where there is no trochanter, there is more than 5 centimeter proximal femur loss. There is no option, especially with white canals, to go for uncemented conventional stems. Last case, 75-year-old uh, THR done 10 years back, the stem is cemented. So now proximal femur prosthesis is not our first option to reconstruct. It's not the go-to option. The first, uh, first option always should be an uncemented stem where you can get distal hold properly without comp compromising on the strength, the fixation and the integrity of the reconstruction. If you can do all that, then one should go for an uncemented modular type of a stem. But here again, the bone is so fragile, the pieces are so thin that an uncemented prosthesis without proximal 5-6 centimeter of support just won't work and will fail. Again, this is a great case for proximal segmental uh, femur prosthesis and elderly patient, they mobilize fast and uh, the results are pretty good. Very similar case here also for a periprosthetic fracture where the bone proximally is really compromised. Regarding the post-op rehab, immediate weight bearing, you can use an abduction brace to protect abductor and soft tissue repair, which I'm sure Dr. Manish will talk about in more detail. And most of these elderly patients may use a cane because of abdu little abductor lurch. Anticipated problems, complications, instability. So dual mobility is a good option to prevent instability in these patients. Limp may, may happen, but these patients want to get mobilized fast and get on with their life. 
one rare complication but we have to be cautious about is over lengthening because there is no abductor restraint so over lengthening is a problem to when you want to achieve stability leading to sciatic nerve symptoms so one has to be careful of the version because there is no gt and lt to guide us so one has to take the uh, the tibia and the interepicondylar axis for your version and uh, attain stability by soft tissue tension preventing sciatic nerve symptoms so i think this in summation are the indications for proximal femur replacement in the revision arthroplasty scenario in 2021 as we speak thank you very much thank you anup i think it's a very very well presented uh, the three things i i wish to reemphasize what you have uh, said to some extent the one uh, that the size of the stem in a tumor processes uh, with my experience i feel that less than 10 a uh, millimeter stem is very much prone to have a uh, breakage in the post operative i have had uh, two of my patients who had the breakage of the stem the second about the abductor mechanism should be sutured very well the 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 uh, maintenance of the abductor mechanism is very important and third about the cup side uh, the acetabulum either the dual mobility as you rightly mentioned or the constraint liner uh, is my choice I think these three things are very important uh, in these tumor processes. Or dual mobility. Yes, yes. Yeah, let's let's have uh, Dr. Manish Agrawal's uh, opinion. Dr. Manish, welcome to this webinar. Well, well, thank you very much for having me, and it, it's actually a real pleasure to see all these cases because, uh, considering the uh, bad prognosis for many of the tumors, these are a pleasure because you know these patients are going to live. and and enjoy the reconstruction that you do as as a surgeon now i agree with uh, what dr sharma said about all the points that have been put in i think the most important part is to get the abductors and the vastus back together in their correct lengths and actually if you can keep a continuity between the abductors and the vastus that's a huge help because that prevents any kind of uh, muscle shortening of either group and the functional outcomes even though it's a massive tumor process is the functional outcomes are very good the limp is very little and these patients are able to walk very well they have active slr as well as active abduction in due course of time so i think more as important as the bone reconstruction is the soft tissue reconstruction which which we have to prepare for now in tumors very often we don't have enough muscle to be able to approximate these things together but i think in non tumor cases like these arthroplasty cases we always have the she the you can say a layer of bone which can keep the continuity between the abductor as well as the vastus and we should aim to preserve that even like when you said when you did the extended uh, trochanteric osteotomy i think what you are actually doing is to keep that whole sleeve intact the soft tissue sleeve is all kept intact and then which is put back when you wire back the trochanter so exactly something like that if you can do when you are reconstructing the proximal femur the results are going to be good and most of our tumor cases we actually don't use a socket therefore we don't have to worry about dislocation because if you take a purse string suture through the capsule the amount of dislocations is very very rare i mean we hardly ever see a dislocation because the head is large and it's in it's in the socket and with that purse string you don't get dislocations but if you're doing it like what anup showed that it's it's a post infective situation or you're doing it in the elderly where the cartilage is not good then then i think you will do the socket and then yes a dual mobility or or you put in a constraint liner as dr sharma pointed out i think it's extremely important because otherwise you would end up with uh, dislocations thank you thank okay, you uh, manish can we have your case sure It's yeah. very similar to what you've been seeing. So let's let's just show you a little variation of all the proximal losses. In the meantime, Anup, a couple of uh, points regarding how to maintain the limb length. As you told, you may land up in the over lengthening. What are the tips uh, intraoperatively? Yeah, correct. So when you put a trial prosthesis, the patient is in lateral position. One should look at the knee and the ankle. Our our classical way. another way is you can put a steenman pin pre operatively in the iliac crest measure to a point let's say below the lesser trochanter and recreate this and always keep your hand on the sciatic nerve keep palpating it is not becoming like a, a shoe string and becoming tight so those are three things to maintain length thanks yeah manish please go ahead 
So uh, I would first like to acknowledge that this is not my patient, but this is Dr. Agarwala's patient on which I was called in. I'll tell you at what stage. So this this was the situation uh, that the patient had uh, uh, presented with when I was involved with the case. And let me just take you through all what this patient had undergone. So if you look at his history briefly, he had a bilateral total hip done 19 years ago in 2001. He, he had both his kidneys failed. In fact, he's had uh, two renal transplants which have failed and therefore he is on dialysis every alternate day uh, because of which again, he has a lot of metabolic issues and you can see on his x-rays, all this heterotropic bone formation, which, which we are seeing is, is because of his kidney failure. Now, uh, uh, on, on the right side, he has, he, in 2017, he underwent a revision for the socket because uh, uh, he had worn out his socket. But because they did not have uh, uh, 22 mm uh, socket liners, they had to revise the stem as well. So he had a complete uh, revision on the right side. He was fine on that side. But even at that time, if you see the left side, the, uh, the left side is showing signs of uh, stem loosening. One can see a lot of lysis, internal osteolysis and expansion of the stem, which, which initially was ignored. But then he, as he had more pain in February 2019, he kept complaining about it. So left side was revised in February 2019, but I don't think this was a, a good placement of the stem. So uh, uh, I think because of the narrow stem down and uh, it, it, it's a little bit of uh, connectivity is poor there. Yeah, placement. So his, his problem actually did not solve because of that. And, and he kept getting more and more lysis. He had more and more pain. Again, you can see the x-rays in February. You can see again the x-rays in September. Finally, in September, he had a revision again. And at that time, uh, he, he's got this kind of a solution stem, which was done for him. Now you can see that between September 2019 and January 2020, actually he's had a lot of collapse where the osteotomy has been done. And because of, again, the stem has become loose. He's finding it difficult to bear weight. And this is the situation in October. He's actually got a frank non-union at the proximal part. And the stem is loose. You can see that uh, the windshield viper uh, effect. The stem is moving inside that broad canal. And this is a time when uh, I was uh, involved because this patient was wheelchair bound. And the impression was that like what Anup showed that we would like to use a tumor prosthesis here. Now, when we did his uh, pre-op workers workup, we found that uh, uh, doing a tumor prosthesis here was not going to be easy because of the size of his femoral canal. When we measured his femoral canal, this was actually 25 millimeters in diameter. And we don't have any anybody supplying us stems, which are even 23 millimeters in size or leave alone even 21 mm in size. So we checked with all the companies, we waited for implants and because of this COVID situation, Actually, we could not get anybody to custom make the stem for us, which we could fit onto a tumor prosthesis. Now, when we checked with the Wagner system, which we thought which can have a good distal fit with white stems, though their inventory shows stems up to 25 mm, they don't stock them in India. And the biggest uh, diameter stem that they had was 19 millimeters in the 305 mm length. Now, why this length was important because he was already quite short, you can see here from the length. So I would need to use a 305 mm stem if we have to have sufficient grip in the distal canal. So what do we do? Anup, uh, do you want to have any uh, uh, solutions? What, I mean, uh, if I put in a mega prosthesis here, I think I'm going to ask for trouble. It's going to fail. Manish, you please go ahead. We'll have a discussion little. So finally, what we decided was that we'll try with Wagner's, but I also kept a mega prosthesis prepared in the sense is that we would use the body segment as a stem. Now, we, in a total femur, you have this kind of a piece which has got connectors on both sides. And we could build it up to any length. So if the canal was 25 mm, 
this is 24 mm and we could have used this as this is what we said we will use as a backup so we finally went in the usual thing the lateral position collect the fluid for culture all that heterotopic bone we had to actually remove to get access to the hip at that particular point of we thought initially that removing the stem is going to be easy because it is loose but it wasn't because of the bony ingrowth in the proximal part so we had to actually uh, slit open the proximal segment the stem stem initially would not come out then then we we just did an osteotomy and you can see on this removed stem that there was proximal ingrowth very surprisingly and and nothing distally after that we reamed the canal we found that 19 mm size would be quite okay with the cement mantle around when we took the c arm shot so that is what we finally decided to use the wagner stem which was 19 mm and 305 mm long so that is how we tried now because we wanted to give him length we had to calculate how much of a stem we would have kept proud so that we can fit him to maximum possible length to reduce his shortening so we then calculated that 9 uh, cm it has to be from the tip of the trochanter made a mark on it and then we cemented this uh, stem inside finally once the implant was in position we we wired the uh, proximal bone back again keeping the attachment of the abductor and the vas tie and he's been able to walk without pain and and he's just come actually for uh, suture removal yesterday and he is extremely comfortable pain wise doesn't need any pain killers anymore and he's able to wait there and walk on this so that's that's it okay why do you think i mean say you know Tumor processes would have been not would have been helpful. Well, if you have a very small stem, if you don't have a wide enough stem, it becomes loose very very quickly. If you put a very thick mantle of cement, uh, the, these joints won't last. And and what about this? What about this? Cemented and uncemented. yeah no just i was telling you have cemented and uncemented stem. Yes, because I had no. I mean. the only take home message which i have from this case is that i think uh, we all have to insist that the companies keep the whole stock inventory stock because uh, these are the situations when we need it and they don't because they are not used frequently these are these items are just not kept in stock here whereas they are available elsewhere in the world so i think somewhere down the line we all even as an association need to get together and make these implant companies keep the full inventory available to us uh, dr manish Uh, Dr. Padhi here. Uh, actually, I want to uh, know uh, how is it uh, because we know that uh, a polished uh, stem uh, for cemented implant is a better implant uh, than a uh, fluted one. So um, I think uh, uh, Dr. John can also comment on this. Well, again, um, one more question to Dr. John was: Could we have used impaction grafting to build up the bone stock in his distal femur? Because we can see that the canal is very wide and the bone is very thin. Yeah, I mean it's amazing how much bone he laid down in the soft tissues, the heterotopy of bone, isn't it? Could we just go back to that actually and have a have a look at it again? I think. I'll I'll just share it again. I mean, I think when when you have this sort of diameter distal, you you know, in the distal femur, you have to use cement. I mean, there's no other sensible option. Um, so to have a, a sort of modular system that you could cement the dist into the distal femur, I think, is is the only way forward, really. Uh, John, uh, whenever we do a, the, we are revising a solution stem, uh, it's a very troublesome and, and um, uh, dangerous stem because yes. it <laughs> it, uh, it uh, uh, so well becomes one with the bone that removing it is a is a big challenge. Manish, I'm sure that you must have had a very difficult time. Yes, <laughs> not very difficult, but because we had to cut the femur and then we got it out because it was stuck only. I mean, it was anchored in the proximal part rather than the distal part. I think Rajiv, the name should change. It should be called a problem stem now. Yes, <laughs> you need a solution to that stem. <laughs> yeah, very right. So I think John, the question was whether can we cement, uh, do a impaction bone grafting in this case? 
Um, I was just going to have a look at the x-rays again. I'm going to show you the x-ray once again. Just, just a minute. I mean, the problem is that it's a transverse fracture at that point, isn't it? But the proximal femur looked... I mean, how much did you have to destroy the proximal femur to remove the solution stem? We had to cut, slit it open. We really did not have to lose bone stock. Okay. So I suppose my question is, could you have reconstituted a, a proximal tube? Uh, I mean, the well, truth, you probably could, couldn't you? The problem we have, of course, with the extra is that it's the longest one is 260 millimeters, which wouldn't have been long enough. So uh, you've had to find a longer stem to use um, to do an impaction grafting. John, could, could you have put, uh, you know, um, some mesh around the middle part and convert it to a total, you know, tube of uh, femur, do impaction grafting and do cementing? Yeah, we, we occasionally did in the past use a <coughs> circumferential mesh in the middle part of the femur, but we stopped doing that because we saw some non-unions and somewhere there was subsidence. Oh. So I think we would accept shortening at that place and actually being a cemented stem, you could leave it longer at the other end. Um, so I think you probably could here. I mean, I would try and, um, you've got to reconstitute a tube. So it needs pressure, mesh in the proximal femur. And no doubt there will be some windows in that diaphyseal part. But I think if you could get a long uh, stem, um, how long was the one you put in? 330. So you probably need- 305. 305, so you'd need longer than that, um, that you, you probably could have done, but it, it would have been make it up as you go along, I think, because it, it certainly you couldn't use the extra system, it's not long enough. But the technique you could use, I think. I think with the- so, Manish, uh, like did you ever uh, think about reef in this case? Uh, you know, it's got our distal locking screws also. They don't have uh, the dias and the length, they didn't have it in stock, we asked them. The problem with the COVID thing was they were not able to import any stems and they don't stock them here, not unless right. you need them. Because it's, it's used so infrequently that uh, they, they don't find it worth keeping it here. The distributors don't keep it here. Right. Now, and that's something, think, uh, yeah. you know, nobody was willing to make it because I could not get a custom implant made. We use so many custom implants from everywhere, but nobody was willing to make the custom implant in these times. and. How long can we make him wait? He's, he's on the wheelchair, he's on dialysis every alternate day and he was miserable. So finally, we, we know that Wagner, which is cemented in, is not the great solution, but I simply don't have anything else to offer. Uh, Dr. Manish, uh, how, how about a uh, tumor processes as you do it uh, very quickly and the patient has comorbid factors with creatinine and uh, on dialysis, cardiomyopathy and all? How long would it take to make? No, no, you, you will do it very fast. You can, well, because you I, usually I, I do it. I don't think the speed is an issue. Putting in a prosthesis never takes much time as long as once, once you, do, you have the right size no. components. But so why, why, uh, why, you don't why have you a tumor to resect and you, you just have to revise this. These are quick surgeries. These don't take very long. So that would have been a better uh, choice in this with these comorbid uh, factors. Yes, but uh, uh, you know, putting in just the, on the Indian system that we have, the biggest size stem that we had was 12. They, they, they were not willing to make the 17 and the 19 and 21, which we custom make when we need it. But in a commercial um, tumor type prosthesis, I mean, this patient's elderly on, on dialysis. So the, the, width, the diameter of the stem is not the really most important thing, is it? It's get the distal length of fix. Yeah, now we, we've been in two, three cases where we have done with a smaller stem, with a big cement mantle, they have had very early failures. And, and that's the reason why we stopped doing it. And we've realized that you need to have a thick stem, otherwise uh, it just doesn't stain. Either they would uh, end up loosening inside or it, they end up breaking the femur. But of the modular tumor prosthesis, they go more than 12. Yeah, now this patient also had a cost issue. So I was forced into using something which he could afford. I mean, I, I, he, I could not import a, a, a system which, I mean, like the JMRS system would, was about five times the cost of the Indian system that wow. we did. And he was not able to afford it where I could have got a stem which was about 17 mm. But again, mm -hmm. the biggest stem that they have is 17 which they have in stock in India. They have not kept the up to the 21, which they normally have if they had the full inventory with them. Okay, so we need to move ahead now. Um, I think the next case is uh, Sutanu.
case on massive defective tube metallosis yeah um, thank you i'll start sharing the screen yeah so for the last uh, about couple of hours <laughs> i have seen we have seen the whole gamut of uh, the femoral revisions so this is uh, one similar case uh, of a case of femoral bone loss in which uh, we have done a revision thr so this was a 49 year female patient uh, she was having an, a pain and limp for more than one year she had got a thr done elsewhere 17 years back and uh, since uh, one year prior uh, one year prior to that she had some sur surgery most probably a core decompression uh, they could not tell the nature not uh, produce the papers of it so definitely uh, she presented with this definitely with this we can see that uh, there is a gross uh, uh, osteolysis both around the acetabulum and the femur uh, there is uh, upriding of the head that means that the poly has surely worn out badly so the abhi thought for uh, revising this case and uh, she was barely able to weight bear on her lower limb we got a uh, ct scan done so these are some of the cuts that i only have there was a shortening of about 2 cm the infective workup was done and they were normal so uh, taking it as a case of aseptic loosening uh, i had to go ahead uh, keeping everything in the armamentarium and uh, the plan was well after explantation to see the defect and proceed accordingly so on opening up we could see extensive metallosis and destruction of the proximal femur and the acetabulum both of it there was a lot of all those blackish tissues around and uh, it took quite some time to remove them so the one which was near removed it there was a lot of bone loss in the proximal femur the femoral implant was very loose and it came out easily and there was an absolutely worn out poly there was loose implant on both sides and after removing them continued with the debridement this is uh, you can see a picture of the poly worn out on one side completely it was the head of the femur was hitting onto the acetabulum which had also become loose and after removing the acetabulum and the careful and debridement uh, of all the uh, metallotic tissues well i can't say all but almost all as much as we could do with the naked eye very carefully debriding and then uh, both in the femoral and acetabular side so according to the classification that has been discussed in detail previously so this appears somewhere around 3a in the aaos class uh, in the paproxy classification and about uh, three in the aaos classification so the different options we have already discussed about it uh, i had also harvested the iliac crest because the acetabulum there was deficiency in the, in the superior part of the acetabulum the anterior and posterior wall were reasonably okay but not so good as in a native acetabulum of course so use the part of the iliac crest to create the deficient acetabulum from the superior side fix this with a couple of screws i'll go through the acetabulum quickly and uh, put in some graft and a mesh to in the medial side and put in a gripsion cup as uh, this was in 2016 yes uh, and that time uh, this was the gripsion revision cup which have, is known to have a good uh, intake very quickly and the acetabulum was placed and then coming down to the femur uh, i had uh, chosen a long uh, fully porous coated stem that is a solution stem we have been talking about that for quite some time now i have been using this stem for quite some time and have had good results in both difficult primaries and revision hips so uh, placed in the done the trials uh, checked on the c arm got a suitable diameter it was about 13.5 and then uh, placed the trials in and then finally stem in so there was a proximal femoral uh, defect uh, in which uh, i used a uh, bone substitute that is the calcium sulfate calcium phosphate mixture and then uh, along with it put in the bone uh, 
a bit of uh, cancellous bone graft more which had uh, which were left over from the iliac crest and this was a post op x ray uh, she was uh, kept on uh, three weeks of bed rest i know which is uh, she she was allowed sitting up on bed but i did not allow weight bearing for at least for three weeks until at least the cup had at least got some hold inside and uh, this was the picture at around six weeks and uh, then the patient started weight bearing protected weight bearing initially partial and then finally went on to full weight bearing this was the picture at 6 months and uh, part of the graft uh, proximal graft resolves but uh, it is known in studies that the distal part of the stem starts getting fixed by now we had a reasonable good length of about 6 cm of uh, distal fixation and it was holding good uh this is just the pre covid area for uh, covid era x-rays i asked her to send on whatsapp so the quality is not so good uh she is doing well it's almost 5 years now and uh, she is also uh in the fall this is a recent x-ray she sent me yesterday and uh, she is sitting she is walking even though i have strictly told her that not to walk without any uh crutch uh, the elbow crutch on the opposite side I have strictly told her that she can land up in complications, but she says that she is doing her activities of daily living quite comfortably. I mean, reasonably comfortably, and she is probably also walking without support, which is not advisable. Now, this was a. I was going through the literature. This was a paper in 2013. In the it was a review article by uh, Paprosky and Neil Seth uh, in the uh, AAS Journal. Uh, they have. This was a long review article which uh, compared. cemented revisions in these cases with uncemented there was a marginal difference they said that uncemented uh, revisions did uh, slightly better bone incorporation was in the distal solution porous coated uh, stem was almost 82% at 6 uh, years and there was 14% fibrous incorporation and 4% had not incorporated there were other papers which i went through which showed uh, similar things comparison of the cemented and uncemented things and a uh, good uh, result with distal press fit fully coated uh, fully coated porous fixation and uh, some more regarding uh, we have been using this uh, the stimulan and the ginex uh, quite regularly for infected arthroplasties or other infection or non union cases or where in trauma cases were needed as a bone filler so this was used in this case and it has stood well uh, other synthetic bone substitutes like the allogran or bi tri uh, calcium phosphate all these can be used so uh, these give support for at least 3 months to 1 years one year until the distal part of it is uh, well fixed the advantage of it is there's not uh, much of donor morbidity and the other advantage we are uh, at a disadvantage of not having other sources of uh, like uh, allograft and other things so summarizing what i uh, pick up from this case is that a uh, careful and patient debridement of the whole metallosis is very important it takes a lot of time and a lot of patience uh, that helps in a better result later on we have to assess the femoral bone loss after debridement and the proximal bone loss needs a good amount if there is a proximal bone loss such, such needs a good amount of press fit distally along with the long porous coated distal fitting stem uh, autograft can be combined or uh, if it is in good number can be used for the proximal bone graft refit along with the mesh as uh, uh, professor timperley had also shown and bone substitutes also help in these cases uh, we have used bone morphogenic protein uh, which solution which is impregnated in a collagen bound which uh, we have used in some stubborn non unions and difficult non unions in a few cases and it have given very good results at that time this was no, not available or did not come to our mind but nowadays if this case was been done today i would have probably used that collagen mixed with uh, autograft and the collagen uh, uh, impregnated with the bone morphogenic protein and this patient we had also given teriparatide both for our osteoporosis and it has been clearly seen we have used it in fracture cases that it really helps in good bone formation and we had used other anabolic pharmacological agents 
phased weight bearing and preferably at least a single crutch support lifelong which i still uh, tell her that she has to continue counseling about what is the situation accordingly what she might need uh, that she should follow the uh, precautions that we have said be prepared for other surgeries and uh, obviously the financial issues and all that thank you so much thank you sudhano i think uh, i'll take probably one question because we are already over time now so anybody has got a question for sudhano yeah just one uh, comment uh, uh, rakesh that um, uh, the solution stem as we just discussed uh, uh, in earlier cases also uh, could be a problem in future so that's i think it's a problem it should be uh, it should it's it should have seen its last days now right right it should be gradually phased out yeah yeah phased out right what was the diameter of the solution you used 13.5 13.5 okay because your proximal part is not supported so better to avoid exactly. you no know, but luckily we had got a 6 inch about a uh, 6 uh, inch so clever and can you get your case study ha ah, yes sir sure sir yeah i yeah. think just like in dr rajiv's case there may be a breakage of that uh, at the diaphysis can i share my screen yeah, yeah yes you can clever yeah pardon i'll just clear out is it visible yes yeah. you are visible and audible uh, clarin okay so good evening for everyone thanks for the great opportunity here by we are sharing one of our case report with a massive femoral defect which was done uh, way back in 2013 by dr suri sir and we just want to share the principles how our unit uh, handled it so in 2002 a 48 year old man with a known cro chronic kidney disease had a fractured neck of femur so he had underwent a cement total hip replacement after 10 years he had a aseptic failure of the femoral component for which he visited the another unit so they planned for a cemented osteoblock cup was retained and the femur was revised with a long cemented cup but intraoperatively they had a periprosthetic fracture for which uh, they augmented the uh, arthroplasty with the menin plate fixation and uh, by 2013 that is within a year the patient presented with a painful hip and a discharging sinus as there was no uh, mechanical and biological stabilization so on clinical examination there was a discharging sinus mild warmth and tenderness around the surgical scar the patient had no other foci like dental caries skin lesions and uti or no foot drop the elevator blood parameters cbc esr crp was suggest a periprosthetic joint infection and radiological investigation include the the serial x ray which showed a subsidence and unstable femoral processes and loose acetabulary cup so we have, uh, we have the habit of doing ultrasound guided aspiration puncture clinic and a direct inoculation into the back duct bottle which uh, we found out it was a methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus and we have a agr pga scoring system and obviously whenever we see a sinus the score is more and uh, we have plan going to plan for a two, two stage septic revision the stage 1 was a mechanical debridement which was very aggressive equivalent to a radio oncological debridement with sharp instruments and midasper and with the chemical debridement with the rule of 3 into 3 3 minutes of betadine 3 minutes of hydrogen peroxide 3 minutes of vancomycin high jet pulse lavage and 6 uh, liters of saline and a intramedullary nail was used uh, as antibiotic loaded cement spacer we used with three packs of palacos along with the 3 grams each so 9 grams of vancomycin we made sure that the patient uh, uh, even though it's a ckd patient the urea creatinine and the glomerular filtration what okay and we know intravenously we won't be able to give much so we wanted to use as much as possible in the local and peripherally inserted catheter for the follow up of antibiotics and we made sure that microbiology sampling of one fluid film and four tissue samples totally five and one histopathology has been sent and during the intermediate stage the preoperative esr crp was noted and the patient had a peak line catheter and the esr crp was repeated every second week fourth week sixth week and he was having only vancomycin and he after six weeks two weeks of antibiotic off was given and once his crp was uh, like came to 4.8 and uh, or even after two weeks of off antibiotic when it was within the less than 10 he underwent the second stage now i'm coming to the point so this is the femur where you can see a massive uh, loss of bone loss and uh, the remaining portion is almost like the distal fifth of the femur stem 
So when we use the standard classification, it's very easy. It looks like a type four. But what are the fixation options which is practically available? So here we share an AGRI functional classification where we divide the femur into uh, five parts. Like the first part is almost like intracapsular, which is suitable with uh, femoral head and neck, which is suitable for a uh, resurfacing. And uh, second one by fib is most of the proximal fitting stems and the proximal third of the femur, which uh, resembles more of the cone shape where the coral and the polar like the stems work much better. And type 3A is close to the isthmus portion where a uh, uh, middle upper cylindrical portion or even a combined fixation like a SRAM and a cone Wagner works better. And 3B is just below the isthmus level where a distal fitting stem or even a cemented uh, fitting stem or a tumor processes also works. And zone four is like where only the last one by fourth of the one by fifth of the portion of the uh, femur is just left for our stabilization. And we also take in account of the abductor mechanism, whether it's intact or it's not there. Whenever it is intact, then we'll at least the patient will be getting a hooded poly and a large ceramic head. When the abductor mechanism is not intact, we make sure that to avoid dislocation, we consider dual mobility or a constraint line. And also consider the reconstruction of the abductor mechanism with a mesh or augmenting with the gluteus mac like trendle, trendle and buck technique. And whatever the portion of the abductor is left, that will be unitized with the femoral component with either SS wire or nowadays with the fiber wire. So this uh, giving the option, most of, we had the option of like option one, where the choosing a long monoblock or modular stem, like a Wagner or Peter Bond Exotech or a Emerald stem. And second option is going for a tumor processes. And if we fail in these two, we know the third option is nothing but a total femur processes. So we have to plan it very judiciously. So stage two and a similar uh, like the stage one, the thorough mechanical and the chemical debridement was done. And the ostabular bone loss was also of type 2C, but we are able to get on with the Cryption Cup 58 using the Jumbo Cup concept and held with the screws. The femoral bone loss type 4, here we used the maximum available reef stem 375, which was showed into the distal one by fifth of the remaining component. And uh, what gave us the strength is the intact medial portion of the femoral cortex. And whenever the lateral cortex is removed or the one by fifth or the two by fifth of the femur component is gone off, that is the curving is nothing. There is no bowing anymore left. It's only the uh, straight femur is left. And the, we are able to place the reef stem having a fixation, at least a decent fixation in the distal most third. And we had uh, the uh, locking screws, which are held in that particular position. And we made sure the patient is not going to put weight for a quite long time. And we made sure the abductor mechanism was intact and it was uh, uh, attached to the reef with the SS wire. And also we used the G-Max attaching to the, uh, the gluteus medius like a tendon bug to increase its abductor strength. And the patient was advised to perform totage for uh, four weeks and 50% of one of the weeks. So it totally took two weeks to start on with a normal mobilization. And by the end of eight years, there is uh, no history of uh, reinfection and asymptotic uh, loosening in the telephonic conversation. So this is the way we, we are able to manage the massive bone defect with the reef stem. And taking in account uh, the femoral version, we have to use the distal condyle and also take in account of the tibia and also take in account of the acetabular component so that it is the combined uh, version is to be taken in account too. And whenever give importance for the abductor mechanism of reconstruction, which was more important to avoid the thing. In this patient, we were lucky enough to have a union, in, even though the patient was a CKD, because he was uh, with the judiciously, we are given injection terifrac and oral calcium was not given. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Clavin. Um, I think we can take probably one or two questions on this. Yeah, sometimes in, in our country, in uh, type 4, the reef stem is very helpful. Uh, you know, it is actually underused uh, probably in our country. Many people don't use even, uh, but I have used in a couple of cases and uh, it has some good outcome. Kalai, what is the follow-up of this patient? Uh, do you have a follow-up? Yes, sir. Eight, 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 years, eight, eight, eight yeah. years, sir. We just okay. had a telephonic call just this week. So we'll be getting the x-ray soon and we'll be published. Okay, but uh, but uh, it is a fully coated, HA coated stem with you know 
um, uh, you can adjust the version and you can attach the uh, abductor mechanism to the lateral aspect. Uh, I feel it's a very good step. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, Clever, and next time you will tell us about AGRI classification also. Karan, <laughs> uh, by any chance, do you work with Dr. Surya Narayan? Yes, sir. Same, sir. Oh, it is Surya's case, yeah. Surya, sir. Oh, yeah. I, I've seen this case. Surya has shown somewhere. Yes, sir. <laughs> No, yeah. this, yeah. Yeah. now yes. we have a longer follow up because yes, sir. Almost eight years still working very good yeah it's amazing that it stayed in place eight years for just that small piece of distal femur it's extraordinary yes yeah, because uh, i believe i believe it's the medial cortex which works so which if works the cortex is supported it will work uh, i think that's what exactly i was saying too that if you have bone on the medial side you actually get uh, much more integration because that's where the Pressure is. Whereas if you put bone grafts on the lateral side, it actually gets absorbed uh, very easily. Because right. that's a tensile strength, right? That's so, right. That's I, had a, I had a one more case where the, they call for a failed uh, chainsaw tumor, bipolar. So they already used a locally available distal fitting stem. Almost uh, the fixation was at the four by, distal most of four, four by fifth of the uh, femoral component. So it was a female, short female lady. And uh, so I didn't plan for any ETO because the proximal uh, GT was missing because of the chain cell tumor, they removed it off. So this time we did, I did an episiotomy right from beginning of the, the, from the close to the isthmus to the just above the condyle level, just an uh, isthmus to have a small wedge type so that a small amount of fem uh, femoral uh, cortex alone is removed and the rest of the femur was removed. We had the two options. One was the reef and second was the cone Wagner. The reef was like available was 375, which is the largest and cone Wagner and uh, sorry, the distal Wagner was 370. But unfortunately, the distal, uh, the reef was somewhat like big. Anteroposteriorly, it was big and it was not able to place it. But uh, luckily, uh, we placed the Wagner 370 uh, just uh, we, uh, we since we didn't remove too much of bone and uh, it since it, it was only a long episiotomy we placed the Wagner and this time we used a stimulants just like an augmentation so filled with the stimulant just like a bone cement across the episiotomy site and also at the junction and made sure the patient was not putting weight and uh, luckily it's been like now two years patient is like walking around well, I will get that uh, x-ray soon and no presence thanks thanks Kalei uh, Anup, do you have that, uh, you know, small presentation about uh, stem, modular and monoblock? Yeah, I have, but it takes five, seven minutes. I don't know, it's 9.30 already. Yeah, I think I've booked Anup for the next one. So I think, uh, <laughs> Monty, we can let Anup go this time. But I've booked him for the next webinar <laughs> already. So I think, I, Dr. Padi, you want to uh, wrap it up or you want me to do that? Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, I think uh, uh, personally, I think uh, it's been great interacting with uh, faculty. First of all, I want to you know uh, thank Smith nephew, who's been a very good uh, support for us in uh, helping us to raise funds and also for the um, academic inputs. And uh, also, I want to thank uh, you know Dr. Timperley for agreeing to join us from so far. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I really want to thank the senior faculty, uh, Dr. Mohanty, Dr. Sharma, Dr. Ajit, uh, and uh, Dr. Anu. And a special thanks to Dr. Manish. I somehow got him. I just pulled him out of his operation theater, I think, today. So sorry, Manish. <laughs> and uh, I think what I is also trying to do is to get these young stalwarts, uh, you know, who've been hiding somewhere and not coming forward. And uh, like today, we've got Kalaiwanan resurfaced. And also, I think the cases by Vijay and uh, Vidya Sagar. Uh, was just excellent. So thank you guys, uh, young ones. I think mm -hmm. we're, hopefully we can probably give you more opportunities in the near future. And uh, do carry the IA flag deeper into your territories. Um, I think uh, once again, thank to all faculties. And uh, I think I shouldn't thank Sutanu much enough because he's my local guy. And uh, as I said, he's the next big gun in uh, Kolkata. So um, with that, I'll hand over to the president for uh, his briefing. Thanks. Uh... Uh, at least I must thank uh, Dr. Devabrat Padi and uh, Dr. Uh, Rakesh Rajput for organizing such a, such a beautiful webinar which covered everything uh, you know about the proximal femoral deficiency. And our next webinar will be on 16th February 2021. That is the third Tuesday. We organize these webinars on the third Tuesday evening of every month. 
and uh, it will be devoted to about uh, robotics that is uh, you know now the generation young generation they are little confused about the robotics there are so much of lectures about robotics so we are going to focus on is robotics the need of the hour in arthroplasty and is there any real advantage and uh, wow robot is uh, you know is it better than uh, navigation or is there any you know pros and cons and uh, what are the is it helpful in the hip replacement knee replacement all these things we are going to discuss so it will be an interesting webinar and uh, dr n rajkumar from ganga hospital coimbatore is going to be convener so dear friends who are watching now thank you very much uh, you know for joining us and you can watch uh, this on our youtube channel anytime in future be a member of indian arthroplasty association go through our website indianarthroplastyassociation.com and today special thanks to you know professor jan temperley from exeter from the on behalf of indian arthroplasty association and to dr manish agrawal you know as well for joining and devoting their time thank you and have a nice evening thank you thank you very thank much you. and thank also you. i thank uh, you know dr swapnil keni who is the backbone of this webinar and uh, my registrar dr rahman who is there you know managing the facebook part thank you all for uh, you know